This is part four of the series entitled The Ways of the Father with His Children. The subtitle is Your Unique Walk with God. Our relationship with the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ is like the Hope Diamond. I was thinking about what is our relationship and of course, all analogies break down at a certain point, but you know, I was thinking about the Hope Diamond because you now back in the mid 80s, I went with a um, uh, couple brothers from the church I was attending at the time and went to Washington, D.C. to the National Museum of Natural History. And there I saw the Hope Diamond. I mean, it's, <laughs> if you've ever seen it in person, it's amazing. It's so beautiful. It's, um, um, it's priceless and unique. Uh, the weight is 45.52 carats. The color is what's what well, one described as fancy dark grayish blue. And it has 74 facets. And so I was thinking about, you know, an analogy, you know, uh, as far as the ways of the father with the children, there are so many different way, uh, ways that the Father has and different, and of course it's beyond 74. I mean, you can take the analogy where you will, but you know, there are different aspects to our walk with God and there isn't just one way to summarize it and categorize it. And um, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. And let no one rob you of your unique walk with God. I want to concentrate uh, for a while on Philippians 121, which is a, one of the theme verses in my life. Now, believers frequently compartmentalize their lives into, into distinct categories. Work, meals, family time, finances, getting gas, shopping, mowing the lawn, pulling the weeds, cleaning the house, and uh, studying scripture, and uh, going for fellowship and worship. Although we devote ourselves to certain tasks and experiences, we are living Christ in all of these endeavors. I don't think it's, okay, I now have the Christ life, but then I have all these other things in, in my life, and I'm you know, on I-5, and this guy just cut me off, and, and now I, I'm outside of Christ, and so I can, uh, uh, there's no excuse for road rage. You're living Christ at that moment. And I think if we have that, that understanding and if we're in the flow of the, of the Spirit of God, that, that makes all the difference. So in Philippians 121, we read, For to me, the living is Christ and the dying is gain. In these few words, Paul blasts apart the distinctions of the mundane life and the Christ life. In a profound sense, there is no secular, secular life and spiritual life. In reality, life consists, as I said, of many tasks, joys, sorrows, relationships, sickness, runs, walks with a dog, friendships, work, commuting, vacation, shopping, playing with one's children or grandchildren, and taking out the trash. Uh, and the list is endless. But do we step outside of Christ you know, to do these things, or are we serving the Lord in all that we're doing? And I think having that perspective of, you know, walking in the Spirit, even though it's a seemingly mundane or social thing, is transformative. All these things constitute your existence, but they do not define your existence. You, you know, your life is hid with Christ in God. And sometimes we have to repeat these things to ourselves. Um, you know, I'm in the flesh, but I don't walk in the flesh. I, I walk in the, in the power and spirit of, uh, of God. In reality, these things are or should be an extension of your life in Christ. Now, I, did I mention shopping? And I, I got the attention of some of the, some of the women. Um, I learned this from Lisa. Um, she, she was serious, and she would talk about shopping in the spirit. And what she explained to me is that there are times in which she felt 
you know, it wasn't some weird fanatical thing. It was just she was aware that as she was going about shopping, that um, it was as though, you know, and just to walk down this aisle just felt an impulse, and she found exactly what was needed or at a bargain price or something like that. And um, that was one of the many lessons that I took from, from Lisa. And so I endeavor to <laughs> practice that. You know, I, I shop in the spirit or make myself available to God wherever I am, whether it is, um, uh, you know, at Costco or Fred Meyer or wherever. <clears throat> now, here's a question. Is Thanksgiving a day or is it a way of life? I mean, I like the holiday of Thanksgiving. I think it's one of the holidays that I feel um, most comfortable with. But um, in, in one sense, um, it is a little bit misleading because every day is to, be, is to be a day of Thanksgiving. And I find myself often, and I pray it will become more often, a practice of you know, thank you, Lord, for this. A new day. I'm awake. I'm alive. Um, you know, thank you for food on the table. Thank you for all these um, many benefits. Thank you that I can hear. Thank you that I can see at least out of one eye. Thank you for my car. Thank you for you know, this assembly. Thank you for um, scriptures to read. I mean, there are just so many things. You can probably compile a list of hundreds of things that... Um, um, you can be thankful for. And I think it's a, a mindset to adopt. Or is worship to be consigned to only one part of one day per week? Or is worship something that is something is seven days a week, 24-7, 365? I mean, we are in that place of worship before God. Let me read a few scriptures along this uh, line of thanksgiving and, um, and devoting ourselves to the Lord. Uh, Psalm 30, 12. So that one may make melody to you, my glory, and may not be still, O Yahweh, my Elohim, for the eon shall I proclaim you, acclaim you. And so it's just this ongoing acclamation of of God and who he is and his goodness and all his wonderful attributes and saving works. Um, and then in uh, 1 Samuel 1, But Hannah went not up, for she said to her husband, Not till the boy is weaned, then will I take him, and he shall appear before Yahweh and abide there evermore, meaning continually from this time forward. And concerning thanksgiving, uh, we read in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. I know that's sometimes really hard when the circumstances are rough, but um, in, in the midst of those things, if we, if we cultivate uh, a mindset of thankfulness, it helps. 2 Thessalonians 1.3, We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly, and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Along this lines, Second um, Thessalonians two thirteen. But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. And then Colossians 3.17, and whatever you do, and this is um, really an amazing text, and whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So if you're pulling weeds, you're getting, uh, changing the oil on your car, there's so many things where um, you can be in that, flow of the Spirit with, um, with the Lord and, and offer thanksgiving. I think the church calendar, for example, has done a lot of damage to um, Christianity at large with its false traditions. You know, Christmas, for example. Um, I'm not a Christmas guy. 
I never was, even, 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 even growing up, I thought, what is this thing called Christmas? Uh, even though I, I played the part of, uh, I think I was eight years old, and played the part of uh, uh, one, of the, um, one of the shepherds <laughs> in a Christmas pageant. Um, but I think in, in this Christmas tradition, which is actually Christ Mass, when did the T get dropped out? If people would pronounce it correctly, Mary Christ Mass? No, thank you. I'm not, I'm not Catholic. I think the greater truth is lost, uh, which we see in Luke 1, 20, uh, uh, 42 through 45. And this is speaking of Elizabeth in her encounter with Mary. And she ex exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Now don't turn that into a Catholic prayer. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. I believe this typologically points to Christ being formed in believers. But, um, you know, in, um, um, you know, in Christianity at large, it's the birth of you know, God the Son. But I think there's a, a beautiful truth here that, yes, Christ is being formed in us and is going to be birthed from us. And this is in line with what Paul says in Galatians 4.19. My little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. And this is, uh, we see the same thing uh, about the Christ life in Ephesians 3, 14 through 19. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in, earth, uh, in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power, through his spirit in your inner being, so that the Christ may dwell in your heart through the faith that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what it is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ which that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And that is um, my prayer for the body of Christ worldwide. Now, um, the, the literal translation is that the Christ may dwell in your hearts through the faith. And I think um, Paul's use of the Christ here and in other places, especially in Ephesians, is speaking of Jesus as the anointed one in his capacity as king, priest, and prophet of believers because um, those were the three offices in, in which uh, a man was anointed. And notice that we're rooted and grounded in love. And this is, you might say, a growth downward. Uh, and it's ever deeper and ever deeper and ever deeper. There's really no end to it. I want to talk about, um, along these lines, of um, Colossians 1.27. And this was a favorite verse of Lisa's. And so this scripture is, we inscribed it um, on our gravestone. And there are certain scriptures that meant a lot to Lisa, and therefore it made a, a, a great impact in my own life and thinking. And I'll never look at this scripture the same uh, again um, in, in, in its former light. Uh, in the ESV it says, To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And that's what we have on our gravestone. Christ in you, the hope of glory. The better translation is, in concordant literal, to whom God wills to make known what are the glorious riches of this secret among the nations, which is Christ among you, the expectation of glory. And so... It's, it isn't hope in the standard sense of, um, uh, you know, we hope so, maybe so, may come to pass, maybe not, we hope so. That's the way hope 
has become, it's become uh, rather elastic in that sense. Rather, um, you know, the Greek word here conveys a sense of expectation. It's going to come to pass. It's, we expect it. And this is the expectation of the glory that uh, awaits believers. And Ellicott says, quote, here the Christ in you, oh, this is kind of a side note, and this is something we'll get to in the other series at some point. I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't uh, resist including this. Here the Christ in you is all in all. The unity of all men in him is an inference, but one which the readers of the epistle are left to draw for themselves. So let's talk about, you know, at, at one level, the unity of, of all mankind. The point is that the expectation of the gospel naturally um, results in the expectation of glory. And it says in, I think it's in verse 23 of Colossians 1, and it's talking about the expectation of the gospel. And living with this expectation of glory, which will happen at the rapture or the snatching away, uh, however you want to term it, is, is practical. And that's something I find myself cultivating day by day, is that expectation. It's a, a come Lord Jesus attitude of the heart. Come Lord Jesus, I don't belong in this world. I, really, I don't know about, I think I know about, about um, all of you, is that we're not home here. We're, we are in boot camp. Let's get it over with and let's get out of here. And so I, I just find that this expectation of glory is a, a, a practical motivation. It's the place where the jet is on the runway or the boots are on the ground and awaiting, it's the jet awaiting takeoff or today we could say, that, you know, the blue angels awaiting takeoff. In Colossians 3, 1 through 4, we read, If then you were roused together with Christ, be seeking that which is above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Be disposed to that which is above, not to that on the earth. For you died, and your life is hid together with Christ in God. Whenever Christ, our life, remember what Paul said earlier, he says, um, for me, the, the living is Christ. To live is Christ. Whenever Christ, our life, should be manifested, then you also shall be manifested together with him in glory. Just a little bit more. When a person becomes a traditional Chris, Christian, he or she often feels the need to join a church, speak in Christianese, and, and sign on to the orthodox doctrines of the Trinity and eternal torment. What gets lost is a personal relationship with God and Christ. That, that gets lost. It gets trashed often. Yes, you live your, um, your, your regular life, but you're in Christ the whole time, and Christ is being formed in you. So all of life is the Christ life. And so when you eat breakfast, when you eat lunch, when you eat dinner, it's the Christ life. When Paul made tents, found himself in prison, or being shipwrecked, it was a Christ life. I mean, sometimes we, we just think, okay, and that's Paul, but then, you know, the, the, he's under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and writing his epistles, and now he's in Christ, but he's there being shipwrecked, he's being stoned. No, that was all part of Christ's life. So I don't think, in, in one sense, there is a, sec, a secular spiritual split. Um, I think of it as a false dichotomy. And so I hope this is a blessing to you that for us to be living is Christ. Amen. And it's every day, every moment of the day. And I'm not saying we do it all perfectly, but it is something which we find ourselves as we yield to the Spirit of God. God is forming Christ in us, and the natural expression of that in life is Christ. Amen.